Everyone, good evening and welcome to the first operating budget forum for the 2023 budget process. Uh, today's topic is Pittsburgh's emergency response operations. My name is Patrick Cornell in the Office of Management and Budget and I'm the Deputy Director. Let's get going. We have uh, four departments here tonight ready to, to walk us through how the operating budget relates to emergency response. Um, and I'm excited uh, and thankful that everyone is here. All right, general agenda. We're gonna go through an overview of the budget in OMB. We'll talk about how emergency response really relates to the budget. We'll move into conversations with public safety, community health and safety, public works, and mobility and infrastructure. I'll highlight some opportunities for engagement and then we'll move into the question and answer session. All right, so first the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, uh, has two divisions under Mayor Ganey's administration with some different teams in each. The first division is management. Um, within this, this group, there is um, you know, the chief level, the chief uh, operating, operating administrative officer, Lisa Frank, chief economic development officer, uh, Kyle Chantelopoli, and the chief procurement officer, Jennifer Oldsinger, and her team on the procurement. Um, on the budget division is uh, myself, um, leading the capital team, the community development team, and the operating and special revenue team. Um, we are guided by Deputy Mayor and Director Jake Pollack. Uh, I will note here that the community development team is funded by the U.S. Department of Ho uh, excuse me, Housing and Urban Development, um, and those their programming includes community development block grants, emergency solutions grants, housing opportunities for persons with AIDS, home investment partnership programs, uh, among others, and those are budgeted as part of the capital team. So there's a lot of a lot of interaction there. I'll also note that the special revenue team includes the grants office um, and our grants officers. So first, I want to run through the jurisdiction of city services. Um, I'll just note that the city does not have direct responsibility for services outside of the nine council districts indicated on this map. Um, this is the current reapportionment map. We know that a new map will go into effect next year. Um, that, is not, that is to say that we sometimes have partnerships with other governments, with other boroughs and townships um, to, to provide services and have uh, you know, strong relationships. For example, we partner with the borough of Wilkinsburg for fire and trash services. Uh, we also do not have legal authority over the following. This is a long list, so bear with me. County, state, or federal roads and bridges. Schools, those are handled by the Pittsburgh Public School District. Public transportation, health services, most human services, the jail, the court systems, non-city of Pittsburgh public safety response teams. Um, you know, that could include the, the county teams, um, the universities, public response teams, et cetera water infrastructure, and the public parking infrastructure and enforcement uh, is the Pittsburgh Parking Authority. Again, cooperation agreements are possible with all of these different groups and entities, um, and we do have meaningful relationships with all of them. Moving into the budget, there are two budgets. Um, today, we're going to focus on the operating budget, which funds your day-to-day -day expenditures, um, and it pays for general government activities. The other budget, major budget, is the capital budget, and those projects have very specific definitions. Um, you know, per code, those projects must be used to design, build, restore, retain, or purchase any city-owned asset. They have a minimum life of fifty thousand dollars. They have a minimum useful life of five years, and they're primarily funded via bonds, which is debt issuance, or pay-as-you-go, which is an operating transfer. Sometimes there are federal and state funding opportunities. Uh, and like I mentioned before, the Community Development Division has a lot of federal opportunities here. Um, if you need a recap on the capital budget, uh, we have finished public engagement. The survey has closed, but all three uh, capital budget forums are available on YouTube and on the Engage page, which I will discuss later. So what does each budget fund? <clears throat> the operating budget funds Employee salaries and benefits, it's, it's a big chunk of what we do. Um, our day-to-day -day operations are really handled by the people um, across all of our facilities who have the expertise to do what they're doing. Another major component of the operating budget is pension funding for retired city employees, debt payments, 
Uh, like I mentioned before, those are actual payments to fund our capital budget. So there's a, a very strong relationship between capital and budget here. Lease payments for spaces that we are renting from others, utility payments, ongoing building maintenance, fuel and vehicle maintenance, office supplies, computers and software, internet, professional services. The capital budget really funds uh, construction and major upgrades of roads, bridges, public sidewalks, public parks, excuse me, healthy active living centers, recreation centers, and other city-owned buildings, city vehicles and heavy equipment, major new technology projects, uh, and like I mentioned, community development through the URA and through community development. Uh, and a reminder that these projects all have to meet the qualifications and specifications that I outlined prior. So just to give you an example, um, what's operating and what's capital? Um, you know, some things have really, really obvious relationships. On the left in the top row is Chief Jones. We'll uh, be hearing from him later, uh, looking good in his turnout gear. His salary and that turnout gear is funded by the operating budget. On the other side, uh, the fire trucks and apparatus are funded via the capital budget uh, in our partnership with the Equipment Leasing Authority. And in the bottom row, you'll see one of our refuse employees in public works. Those salaries are funded in the operating budget. Um, but on the right hand side, a lot of our, our trash infrastructure for public receptacles are funded by the capital budget. So here's a fun one. This is uh, more pool and more recreation center. Is it operating? Is it capital? Uh, trick question. The answer is both, depending on what you're talking about. So on uh, the right hand side of the image, the lifeguard would be paid out of the operating budget. Paying for water as a utility would be operating, and pool chemicals and supplies would also be operating. On the other side, um, for capital, the pool lining itself, you know, recently recently uh, renovated, and the roof for more recreation center in that building itself, those would all be capital expenses. <clears throat> the operating budget cycle uh, moves on a calendar year, a fiscal year. So January 1 is the start of our fiscal year. That is when the operating budget goes live. Um, we move through the budget process really at the end of spring, early summer. That's where we do our kickoff and we have public engagement, which we've been moving through. Um, in the summer, we ask directors to submit their budget request to, to the operating team. Uh, the Department of Finance analyzes revenue projections. Um, without, without an understanding of our revenues, we don't know how much we can spend in any given year. From there, all proposals are analyzed for financial, environmental, and equity impacts. Um, we discuss them with departments. We go back and forth. OMB discusses each proposal with the mayor's office and we go back and forth. Uh, in the end, the mayor makes decisions and we submit a preliminary budget to city council by the end of September. From there, OMB makes adjustments as needed. Um, I'm excited to announce that this year we will move into a second round of public engagement um, in October in the short time between uh, the preliminary budget and the November budget. Um, per code, in the, the second Monday in November, the mayor must formally present the budget to city council. From there, our office is hands off and everything moves to council and the legislative branch of government. Council holds agendas, uh, excuse me, holds hearings. Can, they can amend the budget and they must approve it by the end of the year. And then the cycle continues. Um, our team in OMB is constantly monitoring actuals once the budget moves into um, you know, its legal state. Um, so it, it's, we don't get vacation off from January through summer. And I would note also that we are working on a five-year plan. So while we legally pass the budget for one year, we must forecast out for the four following years. So the 2023 budget will actually be the 23 budget and five-year plan through 2027. So what's actually in the budget document? The cover is on your left. Um, it's, a, it's a big document, you know, several hundred pages, but there's a, a wealth of information. There's a budget guide at the beginning that, that goes through and explains some of the detail that I'm referencing now. Um, it explains, you know, what our fiscal year is, what our fund accounting structure is, what our chart of accounts is. Um, it helps split up you know, how, how we enter things into our accounting system and what it means on our side to say, okay, salaries and benefits versus operational supplies. There's information about revenues and expenses with some insight from finance and, and OMB. 
Um, each department has its own section. And what that does is it, it'll give you the organizational chart, the narrative detail, um, the mission of each department, and then it gets into the meat of what positions are budgeted for each department or office um, and what operating budget lines are, are allocated. Um, so that's really the meat of the document and it all adds up into it. Oh, I skipped over, I apologize. The target budget is the top level, um, the big picture, and that is a summary of total expenditures, total revenue, um, and any transfers in or out of the operating budget. I would also note that we have a few key indicators. Um, we have our fund balance, which is kind of like our rainy day reserve fund. And we have in code uh, requirements to keep that above a certain percentage level every year of our plan. Um, we also have debt service requirements where our expenditures cannot exceed, a, a, excuse me, a proportion um, of the total debt. So those are all factored into the, the target budget. Um, the debt and pension information is further detailed and the fee schedule as well. Um, there are certainly other subjects and topics that are housed in the operating budget, um, and we encourage you to take a look. So the 2022 bottom line, uh, revenue was budgeted at 658.8 million. Expenditures were budgeted at 615.1 million. The operating result is the difference between revenue and expenditures. That was expected to be 43.7 million. And then there were transfer, well, there are budgeted to be transfers out of that result. Um, some of that will go to fund the Housing Opportunity Fund with the URA, Urban Redevelopment Authority. Um, some of that will fund PAYGO, Pay As You Go, which is another transfer into our capital fund. Um, and there are a few other uh, transfers that come out of the fund balance. And then after that, we're left with a surplus that goes into the rainy day reserve fund or a deficit that pulls out from the rainy day fund. And as we move through the year, our office does monitor, like I said, actuals, and we do report out on it quarterly. So moving into tonight's topic, <clears throat> excuse me, emergency response. So what do OMB and the operating team have to do with how other departments respond to emergencies? Um, there are two main factors and they kind of break down nicely into the two divisions of OMB. From the management pers perspective, there's top level planning and response. Um, the deputy mayor, the chiefs, everyone is working together across departments with the mayor, excuse me, with council, with the controller, with external parties um, to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, there's also a factor with respect to procurement. Uh, we have very strict rules about purchasing and acquisition of, of city supplies and goods. And in an emergency situation, sometimes those procurement rules can be waived or, or tweaked. Um, that management side really comes as the event is happening itself. On the budget side, what the operating team can do is we can work with departments, maybe after the fact, um, to adjust staffing levels. You know, we can say, in response to what happened, did it work? Did it not work? Um, do you have all of the support that you need? If not, how can we, one, figure out a way to move through that this year, or two, in future years, come up with a better proposal um, and work through a budget request? We can also offer guidance on finding uh, available funding to react to a situation or pivot available funding to react to the situation. Um, like I, I like to say, our budget is fixed, it is a legal document, but there is always some room for flexibility within the individual departments and account structures. Uh, finally, the budget team can do costing for related initiatives. If in response to some situation, um, the, the decision is that there needs to be a new program, our team can work closely with the department to estimate out salary costs, benefit costs, you know, what equipment might be needed, things like that. I will note that emergency response does often require operating and capital components. Um, on the operating side, what you will see most of the time is employee time and expertise is the biggest thing that hits the operating budget from um, the reaction to an emergency. And it's not something that is always easy to measure. You know, when you're reacting to a landslide, it might cost X amount of dollars to remediate it, but it's hard to measure all of the different people's time and salaries that went into that. You know, the director of Domi 
mobility and infrastructure is going to need to respond. The deputy director might need to respond. There might be financial staff who need to respond. So there's, there's a ton of different factors that move into that. In the short term, supplies and rental of specialized equipment if needed. Um, on the capital side, you know, using city owned vehicles and equipment. Uh, and like I said, working for long term solutions that happen after the, after the fact. Excuse me. All right, let's move to our first poll question. Uh, bet you didn't think this would be an interactive experience. So, question one, and Dave, let me know when you're ready on the back end. All right, how many full time Department of Public Safety employees are budgeted in 2022? Is it A, 924? B, 1,989, C, 2,301, or D, 3,188. So it looks like a little bit of a split in terms of results. Uh, the correct answer here is B, 1,989. And uh, the Department of Public Safety is split across five different bureaus. The Bureau of Administration has 137 budgeted positions. That includes financial staff, uh, the Office of Emergency Management, the Office of Special Events, our uh, team of crossing guards, and, and several other components, um, nighttime economy, public information, et cetera. The Bureau of Emergency Medical Services has uh, 213 budgeted positions. Police has 953 budgeted full-time, including civilian staff. The Bureau of Fire has 670 full-time budgeted positions, and animal care and control has 16 full-time budget positions. So with that, I would like to invite Director Lee Schmidt and his team up. Um, we can talk about public safety. Good afternoon, everyone. Or uh, evening, I guess, almost. Uh, thank you for joining us and I'm happy to be here to uh, answer some questions and present about what public safety is and kind of what we do. Uh, so first, I'll give a brief overview of uh, public safety, and then I'll introduce our chiefs that are on from each of the, uh, the three major bureaus. So uh, public safety, as Patrick kind of already outlined, is uh, the largest department in the city. We have about uh, almost a third of the city's workforce. And... Uh, maybe a little more. Um, and we uh, consist of police, fire, EMS, animal care and control, uh, the Office of Special Events who uh, permits and helps organize things like our farmers markets, uh, 4th of July celebration, uh, concerts in the park, movies in the park, as well as permitting any other special events um, like the events this weekend in Picklesburg, uh, Pittsburgh Grand Prix, and uh, Black Music Festival. So a uh, whole litany of different events throughout the city come through special events. Uh, crossing guards are kind of self-explanatory. We have a whole team of crossing guards that cover crossings to make sure our children get to school safely and back home safely. Um, additionally, we have animal care control. They uh, respond to both emergency and non-emergency animal issues. They also handle uh, dead animals. So it's always a helpful part of the job, not the fun part. Um, additionally, we have nighttime economy office that helps coordinate with bars and restaurants uh, to make sure they're providing safe spaces and using best practices. We also have uh, our community uh, office of violence prevention and community services, which consists of our safer together coordinators and our uh, GVI and violence prevention unit. At this time, I will introduce our uh, folks from the other bureaus. So we have representatives from police, fire, and EMS on. Uh, from fire, we have Chief Jones. He's also our EMA coordinator. So he'll be covering the EMA section as well as fire section. If Chief, if you want to jump on and introduce yourself quickly. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Daryl Jones. I am the chief of the Pittsburgh Bureau of Fire. I've served in that capacity for 15 years, just had my anniversary on July 9th. And as of the beginning of this year, I serve as the emergency management coordinator as well. 
and I am here to answer your questions and grant you uh, any explanation to uh, that you're seeking for what we do, what our mission is, and what we hope to accomplish with this budget. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. If I could have uh, Chief Romano now from EMS introduce yourself, please. Uh, Ronald Romano, Chief, City of Pittsburgh, Emergency Medical Services. Uh, I've been serving the city since 1978. Uh, I've been the chief since October of uh, 2018, and I'm in my 44th year. Uh, as you know, we, we encompass many medical emergencies uh, through the 911 system. Uh, we're here to serve you on a daily basis, 24 hours a day. And uh, we'll stand by for any questions or any more information. Thank you, Chief. And finally for police, Chief Stan Grecki. Good evening, everyone. Tom Stan Grecki with Pittsburgh Bureau of Police. I've been uh, with the Bureau since 1988. I have 35 years on the job and recently uh, started serving as the acting chief of police since uh, the beginning of July. And uh, I too am available to answer any questions that you have about the Pittsburgh Bureau of Police and how the operating budget impacts our our day-to-day uh, -day operations. Thank you. Of course, thank you all for being here. Uh, Director Schmidt, I'll start with you. Thanks for the explanation of the organization of your department. Um, so first, how can the community engage with the Department of Public Safety with respect to um, operating needs, wants, hopes, et cetera? So the first line we have is our zone public safety councils, uh, each zone. And it's based on the police zones, but they are uh, for all of public safety. Uh, we meet monthly at different times, different locations. Most of them right now are still virtual or hybrid. Uh, those are public meetings that are Safer Together coordinators and usually different representatives from public safety attend on a regular basis. Uh, that's a great way to interact with us. Additionally, uh, the Safer Together coordinators themselves reach out um, and filter requests and information about public safety. And then of course, there's the more traditional means of telephone and email. Um, the general number for the Office of Public Safety is 412-255-8615. Uh, we have someone there uh, Monday through Friday during the day to answer those phones. And then uh, on the city's website, you can find a full directory with emails for all the different departments and bureaus, uh, myself, as well as the chiefs and various people who are there. So the, those are the, uh, the ways to interact with us in general, um, submitting concerns, information uh, requests, and then obviously for any sort of emergency, 911 is the way to go with that. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, let's jump to animal care and control real fast. I know Supervisor Dave Madden is not on the line with us. Um, what, what types of emergencies, if you could go into a little more detail, does the Bureau of Animal Care and Control respond to? Sure, so animal care and control, the response, emergencies that they respond to are things like loose dogs, uh, dog attacks, dog bites, um, as well as dogs in distress. So when the, you know, the weather's hot and there's a dog outside for an extended period of time or the dog, uh, you know, a neighbor's complaining as well as uh, they do respond to, to dark, barking dog complaints. Um, and those are kind of the emergency situations. So animal attacks, things like that. Um, they also respond to non-emergency situations um, such as our trap program. So if you have uh, issues with raccoons, brown hogs, um, other animals, um, they will, they do have a trap loaner program, which is very popular. Um, so there's sometimes a waiting list, but depending on the needs, um, they'll prioritize, you know, if it's a rabbit or animal of concern, they'll respond to that and put a trap out. Um, we ask the residents to help us monitor that trap and work with us. And then if something's in the trap, they'll come and retrieve that animal and uh, manage it from there. Uh, they also do for non-emergency, as I mentioned earlier, the dead animal truck. So when there is, uh, you know, an animal that you find deceased along the road or in the parks or on a trail or somewhere, it's, it's kind of cumbersome or a nuisance to the public, they'll come and remove that and have it uh, environmentally properly disposed of. 
Uh, they also work closely with humane animal rescue uh, for animals that they do pick up and detain. So if there's a loose dog, that's where it goes is the humane animal rescue. So if you have a dog that gets loose by chance and you're looking for it, humane animal rescue is the likely place where animal care and control would take that dog. Any other questions on animal care and control? Uh, yes, I have to ask, have we had this summer any incidents with bobcats or alligators like we have in the past? Uh, thanks for jinxing us, Patrick. But no, so far we've been okay. We, um, nothing too exotic this year. Other than, uh, some large snakes, but nothing, nothing too crazy yet. But now that you mentioned it, we might. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. All right, let's, uh, if Chief Jones, if you could come back on, I'd love to talk about emergency management and your, your new role as a coordinator. Yes, sir. Thanks, Chief. <clears throat> um, so one, does the city have an emergency management plan? And if so, what does that actually mean for residents? Uh, yes, the, the city does have an emergency operations plan. The city is required to have an emergency operations plan by the state. Uh, our emergency operations plan is uh, volumes. Uh, we have a basic plan, which is the only part of the emergency operations plan that is uh, open to the public. And on top of that, we have annexes for hazards, uh, specific hazards, everything from flash flooding to uh, hazardous material incidents. Well, we're ready to address those incidents using this plan. Uh, so the plan is in the process of being revised right now. It's scheduled for revision every two years. We have the final revision done. The mayor uh, signed off on the promulgation of that, and we are now waiting for council to adopt the plan by resolution. And then we will be uh, the plan will be in force uh, for the next two years. So it's time to revise it again. Great, thank you. Um, could you walk us through two different scenarios? One, what does your emergency management team do on a day-to-day -day basis? And then two, you know, when they're reacting to a major response. All right, so our purpose is to coordinate. Uh, a previous emergency management coordinator says we are the herder of cats. And our job is to make sure that everyone is playing in the same, in the sandbox at the same time, moving towards a common goal. So uh, we're responsible for logistics, uh, things like emergency housing and evacuation. And uh, we work together, we exercise and we drill and in anticipation of various events that might happen. And so we coordinate all of these different things. In addition to uh, emergencies, we also coordinate with planned events such as the Marathon and the 4th of July celebration, light up night and first night. Those are probably the four main ones we deal with all the time. Uh, so our job is to coordinate and move everything forward, make sure everyone's working on the same page of music. Great, thanks. Any other comments you'd like to make about uh, emergency management? And if not, we'll jump into the Bureau of Fire. Well, yes, just one more. And, and when you were talking about community involvement, you asked about that with the police in. There is a mechanism for community involvement in the emergency management role as well. And that's our community emergency response team, better known as CERT. Uh, these teams are neighborhood teams that we're trying to establish. If we take a serious hit from uh, some type of incident, First responders may also be taken out by that event. So you may have to survive on your own for up to 72 hours without any help. Joining a CERT team, having a, a CERT team in your neighborhood will help you be prepared to respond, take care of minor emergencies, and keep your neighborhood viable until first responders can get there to you. So if you're interested, please visit the uh, EMA, part of the city's website, and find more information for CERT, or you can contact me by email, and I'll put my email address in the chat. Thanks, Chief. I will add the EML, EMA website to um, our resources page before we, we post this uh, slideshow. All right. All right. Bureau of Fire. 
So this seems like an obvious question, but what types of emergencies does the Bureau of Fire respond to? Well, we, we it's more than just putting water on fire. Uh, we also, uh, in collaboration with the police and EMS bureaus, uh, have the hazardous materials team as well. So we, uh, uh, any hazardous materials spill, we're there to contain that particular spill and help to get the cleanup. Uh, in addition to that, we're part of the uh, rescue task force is what it's called, which is uh, we help as a force multiplier for active shooter or uh, active uh, threat events. So what our job would be was it would be to go in and uh, grab people who are victims of this shooting, bring them to a casualty collection point where EMS will do advanced treatment and life support and transport. So we don't carry guns. Uh, we are uh, outfitted for this uh, particular task and role, but we basically serve as a force multiplier, gives EMS some extra hands. And of course, as you stated, we, uh, we suppress fires. We also investigate the cause of those fires. And that's also a collaboration with the Bureau of Police. We have a very dynamic and very well-educated, well-trained, highly motivated fire investigation unit consisting of three firefighters and three police officers. So they work in teams of two and they are very good at what they do as far as fire investigation. Uh, putting out the fire, well, that's the cure. Uh, preventing the fire is what we want to do. And so we have a, a uh, code enforcement and a public education unit. Uh, code enforcement is by Deputy Fire Marshal Christopher Skirdish. Public information specialist is Master Firefighter Lisa Epps Kuda. And so we're out there trying to reduce risk to our community through uh, education and code enforcement. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, so how might these responses that you just worked through, how are they impacted by the operating budget? Um, first, you know, what about staffing? Well, as you stated, we have, uh, we're budgeted for 670 people. 656 of those people are uh, uniform employees. Every day we have 169 people on duty in our suppression division. Uh, our budget, 98% of our operating budget goes towards uh, salaries and benefits for labor costs. Uh, the rest of it is for us to maintain our equipment and to operate the bureau. So uh, at a 98% uh, slice of the pie, you can see how valuable uh, the operating budget is to us to keeping uh, our citizens safe. All right, thanks. Um, could you talk a little bit about that other 2%? You know, what sort of protective gear do you have to purchase every year or every few years? What about um, you know, technology, things like that, that would come out of the operating budget? So you, you, you did mention, uh, you showed my picture and me and my uh, turnout gear. I really appreciate that. You made me a star. You're always uh, a star chief. <laughs> uh, that set of turnout gear that you see right there cost uh, hand, the coat, helmet, boots, trousers, and everything, uh, roughly about uh, two or $3,000 a set. We are required to give each firefighter two sets of that. Uh, if you include the SCBA and other equipment like the thermal imaging camera that you see the firefighters using, it costs roughly $10,000 to outfit each firefighter, have them prepared to go and suppress a fire. In addition to that, uh, there are uh, technology that we use now, uh, including mobile data terminals, which is uh, basically laptops that's hardened and designed to be used inside the vehicles. We receive dispatches through this and additional information on calls uh, instead of tying up radio traffic. So that's very valuable to us as well. We also uh, respond to medical calls. And uh, again, being a force multiplier for our brothers and sisters in EMS, we'll respond, arrive on the scene, try to stabilize the patient. And EMS will come 
and give advanced life support and transport that patient to the hospital. So things like automatic uh, defibrillators uh, are essential to what we do. Uh, having certain medical supplies is essential to what we do. And all of this comes out of our operating budget. Great, thanks Chief. Um, anything else you'd like to add about the Bureau of Fire? No, I think that's about it. Great, thank you so much. Uh, if Chief Romano could, could swing on, he's uh, in the spotlight now. Good evening, Chief. How are you? Good. Yourself? I'm doing well, thanks. Same questions. Could you give us a brief overview of the Bureau? Um, and then we'll move through, you know, what, what does an emergency response look like for emergency medical services, EMS? Uh, the, the Bureau consists of 166 paramedics, 28 EMTs, uh, 10 district chiefs, and seven administrators, uh, which combined to uh, operate 13 ALS ambulances, three BLS ambulances, two heavy rescue and river rescue 24 hours a day. Uh, we're also uh, uh, involved as uh, Chief Jones said with the HAZMAT team. Uh, and uh, we also have our own training division which keeps our personnel trained throughout the year, uh, which are the mandatory requirements and any auxiliary courses that are put together. Also, uh, we, we're, in, uh, we're embedded with the uh, police SWAT team as a TEMS medics, tactical EMS, so that they, they can provide care either for the, uh, the SWAT, SWAT officers and or the, uh, the citizens that they may be apprehended. Great, thanks. Chief, uh, real fast, could you define um, the acronyms ALS and BLS just in case some of our residents aren't familiar? Uh, certainly. Uh, Advanced ALS is advanced life support. And we have those on our para, uh, all paramedic units uh, ride with two, two paramedics uh, for the advanced life support and the EMTs uh, support the BLS units, two EMTs for each BLS unit of basic life support. Thank you. So what types of emergencies does your, your team respond to? Well, as you know, uh, the citizens call 911 and uh, the, the calls are then uh, graded uh, and the information taken by the, the uh, Allegheny County 911 operators and then dispatched out to us. It could be anything for somebody down on the street, someone sick in their home, uh, general, general weakness or a cardiac arrest, uh, which is type of what happens when your heart stops. Uh, Numerous motor vehicle crashes per year. Uh, we cover all uh, type of rescues, elevator, trench, confined space, and you, you name it in between there. But uh, uh, we're fairly busy. Uh, we've, we've been averaging about 80,000 80, responses a year with uh, 60,000 uh, probably actual on-site uh, patients and then about, probably about 40,000 transports a year. Thanks, Chief. Uh, so with all these transports and responses, I imagine um, one of the things that, that would come out of the operating budget would be medical supplies. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Everything from a Band-Aid uh, to your cardiac drugs to your heart monitor, which uh, each ALS unit has, uh, which they, they're, they're $35,000 a unit, which uh, were just recently replaced uh, citywide uh, about in the last two and a half years or so. We should get uh, on the average about 15 years out of those technology changes, et cetera, and upgrades could, can be made up to during that time period. Thanks. Um, could you talk about some of your community programs? I know there's, you know, seatbelt, um, COPE, et cetera, things like that. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, uh, the car seat program is ongoing. Uh, uh, we take appointments uh, to the website, and uh, there's, a, I believe, a phone number associated with that uh, to call in. You can get to, actually, I'm sorry, through the website, and then somebody will respond back to your to your phone call uh, with a phone call. And uh, we also have the community outreach or the co program that uh, we have uh, paramedics that will stand by at different events and answer questions. Also, we have. They will go out teach CPR, AED uh, uh, classes to help people be familiar with that. 
hands-on CPR has proven to be very helpful uh, till we arrive. Great, thanks Chief. Uh, one more question I can't resist asking. Could you talk a little bit more about river rescue and particularly what sort of skills and training that come from the operating budget, those uh, medics and, and members of that team would need? Uh, we have uh, two, two divers on each, uh, on each shift. Also, they, are, they man the, uh, the river rescue boat along with the uh, police officer who's the, the helmsman or the, the driver of the boat. And uh, they're, 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 they're both paramedics trained, trained to the same level. They, they rotate in and out of there. So one day they may be on, an, one month they may be on an ambulance, one day they may, may be on an ambulance, but then they spend a, a, a month on river rescue and rotate. And uh, so they're, they're able to provide uh, ALS care immediately, uh, and they're trained divers. They can they can uh, do uh, surface rescue and then dive rescues as needed along the shorelines and rivers of Pittsburgh. Thanks, Chief. Any other comments you'd like to make about emergency medical services or um, you know your work or your teams? Um, my teams definitely. The, uh, I salute the people on the street uh, every day. Uh, very hard hardworking people keeping their skills up, their education up, and uh, they're, uh, they're, they're earning their keep every day. It's, it's very busy out there. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate your time tonight. Uh, Chief Stan Grecki, you're up. Good evening, I'm on. Great, great to have you, thanks. Um, same questions, could you just give us a brief overview of the Bureau of Police? Yes, so the Bureau of Police consists of 900 members, uh, sworn members, uh, the majority of, of our uh, personnel are assigned to operations, and that, that is patrol, that's zones one through six. Those are the first responders that respond to emergencies or any calls for service, uh, plus the special deployment division. So that includes, and you have to excuse me, uh, that includes the motorcycle unit, canines, uh, EOD, which is a bomb squad, and, uh, and uh, river rescue and some other units. Uh, we also have an investigations branch. Those are all of our detectives. And uh, the detectives are, are responsible for an investigating uh, usually major crimes or drugs. So we're talking homicide, sex assault, uh, arson, burglary, uh, and uh, some other crimes. And then the uh, narcotics unit obviously is responsible for narcotics complaints, nuisance bars, uh, prostitution, and uh, and we have unit or we have members assigned to uh, federal task forces, which uh, aids in the investigation of crimes, not only in the city of Pittsburgh, but, but also within the county and, and uh, helps disrupt those uh, supply chains. We also have an administration branch that is responsible for the training academy and provide, provides a lot of uh, support units such as uh, uh, the courts, uh, our warrant office, uh, uh, and support our computer operations as well. And then we obviously have our command staff. Uh, we have the chief of staff. The chief of staff was responsible for our, our intelligence unit and also our real-time crime center, which provides support to the uh, officers in the field, utilize, utilizing our cameras, shot spotter, and some intelligence information to help aid them in the uh, resolution of, you know, ongoing crimes. And we are also supported by a civilian crime analysis uh, unit that is able to uh, gather all the information from our various systems, including shot spotter calls for service, and our reported crimes to provide uh, uh, information to the detectives, or excuse me, the, uh, well, detectives, officers, and command staff so they can better address uh, crimes in the field. 
Thanks, Chief. Um, so you touched on a lot of the different different units, um, and that directly relates to it, you know, but what types of emergencies does the Bureau respond to? How are things routed? Um, you know, just a, a general conversation, if you will. Yes. So uh, whenever a person calls 911, if it's a police related issue, and uh, I'll just run through things, you know, part one crimes, uh, crimes against person. We're talking homicides, aggravated assaults, uh, rapes, and robberies. And then we're also talking uh, major property crimes such as burglary, theft, auto theft, and arson. And then in addition to those, we handle a number of part two crimes. And we're talking like our domestics, minor assaults, uh, other types of uh, of thefts. We're talking uh, traffic accidents, anything vehicle related, whether it's an accident, parking complaint, uh, disabled vehicle. Uh, we also respond to uh, mental health or persons in crisis uh, uh, to, uh, you know, assist them in getting the help that they need. Uh, Certainly narcotics or drug complaints, uh, loud music, uh, you know, anything that disturbs the uh, public peace we are responding to. Right, thank you. You're welcome. So how are these responses impacted by the operating budget? Um, you know, along with all the other public safety bureaus, it sounds like the majority of your budget is, is really spent on salaries uh, and personnel costs. It is, and uh, and I know it's a small part, but you know certainly we need uh, supplies as well. You know we we do uh, provide some basic life saving measures. You know so we have you know tourniquets, AEDs. Uh, we have a uh, Narcan as well. We need supplies for uh, uh, training, obviously. You know, at the academy level, we have annual firearms training. Uh, we also provide supplies to SWAT, who is uh, very instrumental and successful for the most part in resolving uh, barricade and hostage situations. So we do need some specialized equipment, and uh, also we do we utilize the training funds. Uh, for the most part. Uh, our, our supervisors, we seek leadership training opportunities and uh, frontline supervisor training uh, detectives, uh, in addition to on the job training, also seek uh, uh, professional training opportunities so that they can investigate the crimes that they are, uh, they are assigned to. Uh, and, you know, along with that goes tra uh, travel training as well uh, you know at times our personnel are required to uh, commute to other uh, cities or wherever to interview subjects or or uh, you know uh, for fugitive task force operations great um could you talk about any technology that the bureau has that would come out of your operating budget please Yes, uh, we do utilize a lot of technology and, uh, you know, certainly specialized programs, you know, whether that's accident investigations that needs a specialized program to, uh, to uh, complete their, their, their task. We have a uh, uh, shot spotter as well that, that we, we utilize to you know, respond quickly to gunshots and, and save lives when, you know, we find victims. We have a robust body-worn camera program where each uh, member of the Swarm Bureau, member of the Bureau is outfitted with a body-worn camera. So we do have costs associated uh, with those. Thank you. Um, one more question I have, and then I'll, I'll allow you to, to bring up anything that I might have missed. Could you talk a little, little bit about some of your community engagement programs? Um, I know there's a few different academies, things like that. Yeah, so uh, 
Uh, generally, on an annual basis, we have the Citizens Police Academy and the uh, Student Police Academy. Uh, sometimes, you know, last couple of years, it's been difficult to conduct those because of the uh, pandemic. But we are also heavily involved in uh, community engagement, you know, by participating with the uh, public safety councils. Uh, going into the neighborhoods or uh, participating with the local meetings. We have a very uh, active community engagement office uh, that uh, provides a lot of opportunities to our youth to, uh, you know, attend sports, uh, sports games or participate in other, other pr things that they wouldn't be able to do uh, normally, whether that's like a fishing or some type of outing. Uh, in the past, we have also done uh, cops and kids. Uh, hopefully, we can get that uh, restarted. I think we were up to uh, three summer camps a year before the pandemic. And, uh, you know, we, we have done internships with uh, local universities or have uh, mentoring opportunities with uh, uh, you know, high school students as well. Thanks, Chief. Uh, those are all the questions I had. Is there anything else you'd like to add at this time? I, I, I would say that, uh, you know, our personnel in the field uh, do a tremendous job. There's a lot of demands. They handle a variety of different calls. Uh, some are police related. Uh, some are quality of life issues. Uh, they're required to make uh, a lot of decisions in the field and, and uh, you know, provide referrals when, when they can. I give them a lot of credit for being a jack of all trades. Uh, I think with the uh, public safety bureaus, we're out 24 seven. And sometimes when there's no one else uh, available to uh, respond to a unique situation. Pittsburgh Police responds and figures out a way to do it. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. So next, that's actually a great segue. Uh, I would like to invite in our um, manager of our Office of Community Health and Safety. Um, we do have another quiz. Uh, when was the Office of Community Health and Safety first created within the city of Pittsburgh? All right, looks like uh, the majority of this group got it right. Uh, this office was created in 2021. Um, it's a new team, but they're expanding quickly. And with that, I would like to welcome Laura Jurgowski up to the, to the spotlight, if you will. Thank you very much, Patrick, and, and also not just to my colleagues, but to our residents. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, uh, I, I want to share. So I've been with the city of Pittsburgh since 2017 uh, and began uh, my uh, privileged opportunity as the manager of the Office of Community Health and Safety uh, in 2021. Um, we are uh, an office um, that has uh, work works both with the mayor's office and public safety from a re reporting format. Um, the objective of our office is to address long-standing issues in the community. I think there are um, oftentimes a sense that this was created in response to a particular incident, um, but really these are, are issues around health and safety and the needs of our community that are unmet that have existed for quite some time. Um, we have uh, the opportunity to work with our public safety professionals. You've met our chiefs from our bureaus and our director, but we also get to work with departments like permits, licenses, and inspections, which I'm sure you will meet in another forum, uh, as well as uh, public works. And I believe Director Hornstein is also on, so you'll hear from him later. Um, what we find is that in the city, we have really premier opportunities. All of our, our public safety, or excuse me, all of our city employees have wonderful opportunities to meet with and, un, and know our community members. We have 90 neighborhoods and we know each of those neighborhoods and really each of those blocks, each of those residents have particular desires, needs, and goals that we can understand better. Uh, we can also equip, equip our staff, our city staff, to meet those needs in effective ways. And I'm just going to say I really relate to Chief Stan Grecki because I have a dog and a cat who are also angling to be part of this call. So thanks for your patience there. Um, our office is currently structured 
in which we have two programs, two areas of focus. The first is what we call a continuum of support. And the second is public health focused initiatives. You know, Mayor Ganey, this is an, a tremendous focus of his, uh, is of his office and his work in the city. And we have the opportunity to execute some of that program. So beginning with continuum of support, historically the city has uh, relied on excellent partnerships with um, providers in the communities to address unmet needs such as homelessness, substance use, and mental health. But we have seen over many years increasing needs on in that regard, and those individuals are oftentimes coming into contact with our firefighters, our paramedics, and our police officers, as well as our PLI inspectors and our DPW staff. We know that we have an opportunity when we meet those individuals to help them to access the care they need and to ensure that that care is ongoing for them so that they don't have a one and done interaction and end up right back working with our firefighters who, or our paramedics or our police who may not have the resources to necessarily address the needs that they have. So in our continuum of support, we think of three things. We think of partnerships. So who are the great organizations already doing this work and how can we work more closely with them to ensure that the people we see get their, their needs met? We have programs. So our programs, we focus on uh, programs like co-response, which I imagine Patrick will ask about in a bit, uh, homelessness outreach, which we partner with uh, our friends at Allegheny Health Network, uh, but that we really um, believe is our incubator for a much larger set of programs, which we can discuss, and um, uh, policy. Uh, and advocacy. So how do we change the existing continuum of support, not just focus on that area of crisis, but what are the things that happened before and after that crisis to make sure it doesn't recur and to make sure our residents are safe. Um, in our continuum of support program, we have um, six social workers full time and one part time social worker who's our manager we will be hiring for a social work manager as well. So that has us at 7.5 FTE staff. Uh, those staff members are actually all funded by the Stop the Violence Trust Fund, which you will hear about for a number of our staff. Uh, the Stop the Violence Trust Fund was a fund that was created by a uh, city council to address uh, issues related to violence and to make sure that we're focusing equally on equity and uh, racial equity and health in our community and violence prevention. Um, our, that team principally is working on the high utilizing population. These are people who have recurrent calls where our paramedics, our firefighters and our police are seeing them often. And we wanna help them in, a, in a, a time after that call to make sure that they are stabilized. We've worked with fire and reduced the high utilizing population calls by 92%. And we've worked with uh, among the patients we've worked with and we've worked with EMS to reduce that call by 70, the call volume by 74%. Uh, those are achieved by a, a firefighter and a social worker or a paramedic and a social worker, depending on the medical acuity of a call, going out and meeting with that resident at their home or in a safe place that they designate to help them to access additional care. A lot of those are our residents who are sort of hidden from us, but really have unmet needs. And those residents are um, oftentimes wanting to age in place, but don't have the resources. So we can help them with bridging their uh, medical care in home, getting a nebulizer treatment that they otherwise would have had to rely on EMS for. So these are, um, really important things that we can do, but not always recognize. And I really wanna compliment our community social workers who are doing that work on a daily basis. We also have post-engagement where we're working with all three bureaus. Uh, and so I've mentioned fire and EMIS, but also with police. And so these are, are people who are identified by our officers as needing additional help, particularly as it may pertain to mental health. We have individuals who are hoarding, who may have a number of animals in the home and they don't intend harm to those animals. But unfortunately, because of the number and their inability to care for them, it's harmful for everyone involved. So we wanna figure out rather than citing individuals, rather than criminalizing that behavior, how we help that person to get what they need and prevent uh, a, a additional accumulation of items that could make their home unsafe or additional accumulations of animals, which you know we realize is not, not fair or good care for, for our animal friends. Um, we also are building what we call a co-response program. This is a term that I think is used very widely in the country and means different things in different places. To us, that's going to mean several things. It's going to mean that we have an officer and a social worker who initially begin uh, with an assisted response 
called in by our officers, called in potentially even by our firefighters or our paramedics. And that allows that officer who's very specially trained and our social worker to spend time with that person, to make sure that that person is accessing the care and the resources that they need. And it also frees up our police staff to be focused on critical issues around safety, violence prevention, and the, and the core functions of law enforcement. We'll begin with that assisted response where officers will clear a scene and make sure it's safe and appropriate for others to come in. But as I mentioned, there's an evolution of that program to which point we will actually have direct dispatch from Allegheny County. Um, we're really fortunate to have excellent partnerships with our county. And so we're not only thinking about what it looks like for um, us to be dispatched through county operations, but also what it looks like to ex to partner with other programs that exist in the county. Uh, we work a tremendous amount right now with an area agency on aging and adult protective services, case conference with them on a regular basis, and we hope to expand that to other divisions of the Department of Human Services and the, and the county. Um, we So those are our social work positions. Uh, we additionally have two other critical programs that are funded by partners. The first is LEAD or Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. That's funded by the Allegheny County Health Department's Overdose Data to Action Program. And that will be uh, initiating three zones in the next six months. Those three zones will have diversion case managers that will be part of our AHN program. And those case managers will be focused on people who have really complex needs. So it's a it's a intensive case management working with people in the criminal legal system and in the health systems where we know there's a lot of intersection. It's a model that exists across the country, but you know, being very clear, we know that the nuances and challenges in this region are different than every other region, which are different than every other region. So we will be, we are uh, thoughtfully building that in partnership with our Bureau of Police and in partnership with Allegheny County Department of Human Services and Connect who are building these programs out for our neighboring municipalities. That, fu that program, that, that funding uh, allows for us to have two positions and additionally an overdose prevention coordinator who I'll talk a bit more about on the public health side of things. Um, we additionally have uh, probably one of the most exciting programs that's been operating since the beginning of 2021 called Roots, Reaching Out on the Streets. Uh, uh, they were initiated as part of ESG, and, and Patrick mentioned this er earlier, Emergency Solutions Grants Care Funds that were created, this program was created to address what we feared would be the eviction cliff. We knew that our officers, though they don't enforce uh, evictions, would certainly be seeing people if they were evic evicted and not have the resources and the time necessary to support those individuals. But what we found very quickly was that there was an, an absolute need for more than the outreach portion. And so those teams are moving, have been moving into the assisted response. They've had over 600 assisted response with our, our community and public and our police officers. And this is ranging from someone who maybe is intoxicated and just needs a place to, to be so that our officers aren't trying to keep that person from re-entering businesses all the way to people who have had trauma and don't want to call the police because they have concerns about what that might mean for them, but we know that they need help. So our partners who are doing that are at AHN. It's an incubating program that we see moving over to be part of the city's infrastructure. Ultimately, that program will move into an alternative response model. And most importantly, we have uh, th they have three hubs in the city right now in East Liberty, um, on East Ohio in the north side and on Smithfield downtown where people can come and have uh, service navigation and support. Those teams case conference with our officers and there's tight integration in those three zones. We plan to see that program expand to all six zones. Um, so those are our, our continuum of support uh, programs as they exist now. Um, I, it, it's worth mentioning that we have some programs that sort of straddle both areas, and I'm going to talk about them next. So our public health programs, uh, we have budgeted a pro public health program manager and operations administrator. Um, sorry, Patrick, I'm thinking about my org chart in my mind here, um, and a community engagement coordinator. So those positions are part of our public health uh, arm of our office. and. Um, all of those positions are also funded by the Stop the Violence Trust Fund. Uh, their focus has principally been on overdose-related programming 
And that adds to the budget, our health department overdose prevention uh, program coordinator. So we have uh, worked with EMS to imp implement the country's third pre-hospital buprenorphine program. This is a program that assists individuals who have experienced with an overdose, experienced an overdose and had an EMS response, receive compassionate, uh, medically appropriate care for their withdrawal symptoms so that they can better access resources that exist in the community, whatever they identify. That includes our swim safe program, which we've had the opportunity to work with parks to make sure young people are getting personal flotation devices and parents understand the risks and and uh, opportunities to make sure that their young their young people are safe their kids are safe um, it includes our neighborhood health and safety academy which is funded by a grant from Staunton farm and it inc includes our social community social determinants of health assessment which allows our community engagement coordinator to better help communities to access resources including most recently our work with east hills and miss anita where we're working on making sure that there's fresh produce in partnership with uh, the planning department and um, so we, you know, we we're looking at these very specific sort of hyper local neighborhood based initiatives because we know that that's something the city has the unique opportunity to do. So just refreshing, we have uh, the roots program, and that is an ARPA allocation to from the to the general fund to our operating budget. The health department's overdose data to action program, the stop the violence trust fund, the Staunton farm grant, and then additionally we have a small grant from the Jewish healthcare foundation that allows us to expand HIV testing and our paramedics to perform that testing in partnership with community organizations. Wow. I know. That was good. You answered every single one of my questions that I had written down before I could ask them. So. I'll, I'll, I will take this moment to, to reiterate here that you just mentioned a lot of different funding sources. Of that, the general fund is really the one that is set by the operating budget. Um, the Stop the Violence Trust Fund is part of the special revenue accounts that I was referring to earlier. Um, I was going to say, hmm, it looks like your operating budget is pretty small, but you already jumped into that. Um, and that is one of the transfers out of the general fund that I referenced at the beginning of this presentation. You mentioned some grants. Again, that's a separate special revenue fund. Um, you all just have everything to do with my operating team. I know you interface with us a lot. So um, trying to think if there's anything else I didn't have. Uh, you mentioned the, the academy. Uh, besides that, how can the community engage with your team directly if they're not you know, dealing with an emergency um, that needs a response? I love that question. So we do have a we have a website that we'd love for you to visit, and I'm sure we'll add that to the broadcast. Um, but in case you are a, a aficionado of visiting the city's website, it's pittsburghpa.gov slash OCHS. Um, you can reach out to us to understand how you can get Narcan. We partner with Allegheny County Health Department to make sure that community members can be trained in overdose prevention and also receive Narcan. You can reach out to us uh, if you have an event you'd like us to join you um, in, in promoting health initiatives and working with our public safety partners. We're always really happy to meet individuals and community groups to understand where their challenges are. So we have a, a, a general email address, OCHSPGH at PittsburghPA.gov. You can reach out to us there at any time. You can also reach out to me and I'm sure we'll add my email to that list. Uh, all of that contact information is on our website. Uh, we do have open intern positions right now, um, and we're really looking for community initiated projects. Those are paid internships for individuals who live in the community, recognizing that the title might not be intern, it may be coordinator, it may be something else that you, you share with us because we know that we'd like to bring in our community members to do these kind of community initiated projects. And we're particularly interested in working with community members who may have had criminal legal history or had other challenges to employment so we can work with you on skills building. In particular, we'll be opening uh, the county's second syringe service program. Um, that will be open on Mondays beginning by the end of the summer. We really want that to be a community led program and that would also be a funded opportunity. We can add the job site to uh, the broadcast as well. Great, thanks, Laura. Um, any final comments? I think you covered a lot in the short amount of time, um, but I just wanna give you one last opportunity. I will add that from the operating budget, we're really fortunate to have training funding as well for our staff. As our staff is joining our first responders or going into the community to work with people, we wanna make sure that they're doing so in trauma-informed ways, 
that they have proper certifications and that they really well understand what the risks and safety protocols are for doing so. Everything we're doing, we're trying to do in a really um, thoughtful and integrated way with our first responders to make sure that we are just adding. We're not taking away, it's all addition because we do need to add all of those supports in our continuum. Great, thank you. Um, next up, let's shift gears. Uh, another quiz poll for Public Works. Uh, Director Hornstein is on deck. Um, so quiz number three, which of the following is not handled by Public Works? Paving, refuse and recycling, park maintenance, or facilities renovations? All right, it looks like uh, most people got it. Oh, actually, sorry, that's my fault. It was bridge construction. But either way, it was not bridge construction or paving. Those are both handled by the mobility and infrastructure team. Sorry about that. There's always a, a technical error somewhere, right? Um, but so the, the Department of Public Works, great transition, uh, is comprised of a few different bureaus, administration, um, operations, uh, environmental services and facilities. And we have Director Chris Hornstein here. Um, to help lead us through some of that. And I will actually stop sharing and let him um, go through a slide deck. So I will disappear for a little bit. Thanks, Thanks Pat. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, thanks, everybody um, from Public Safety and OHS, OCHS, um, you know, for pre presenting and talking through their departments before. Um, before I begin, I just really enjoy working with all those folks, you know, top to bottom. Um, it's a great group of people that do amazing work for the community. And so just really appreciative of opportunity to work with them, to help them, to have them, um, you know, help us. Um, you know, I think we partner together on a lot of different things in delivering services to citizens and benefit. And um, it's always a pleasure, um, you know, to be part of the team. What does public works do? Um, you know, there's three types of work in public works I like to talk about. Um, we clean things, we fix stuff, and then we respond to emergencies. Um, you know, this we cover a large variety of services. Um, everything from picking up your garbage to, you know, doing large scale construction projects in parks, um, in buildings. So it's a, it's a large gamut of things that we do. Um, you know, we like to say we have all the skilled labor um, and the trades resist within public works. So we have your laborers, your CDL drivers, um, electricians, plumbers, HVAC techs, iron workers, um, you know, pretty much um, any of those types of capacities you can think of as, as public works. Um, a couple of things I'm going to focus on today, um, of, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus kind of on our litter can collection services. I'm going to focus on potholes and then we're going to talk about emergency response. So, uh, you know, a couple of things that I like to bring up in our approach to management, um, you know, we feel that like our frontline workers are unbelievable in the service that they're doing to the public. A manager's perspective is we're there to support those frontline workers. So we view that as a symbiotic relationship. We need to hear from them. They need to hear from us. Um, and we view the same way as the budget. You know, the budget is one of the mechanisms that we can get our frontline workers the tools and equipment that they need to do their jobs. Um, so I know as Patrick will attest, um, the deputy mayor and all the folks up in OMB, um, you know, we're kind of constantly working together to figure out, you know, how can we get this, how can we get this tool, how can we get this contract underway, how can we get these materials to our folks so that they can do our job and deliver services um, in support of the public and, and in support of other departments doing their jobs as well. So, you know, we really view it as a partnership and as a team. Um, because without it, you know, we can't, we can't put our frontline workers in a position to really succeed. Um, our philosophy on management is we, we, we want to prioritize the safety of our workforce. We currently have a high rate of workers that are unavailable due to injury. Our target goal here is zero workplace injuries. So we're working through some stuff right now um, to really reduce that. Um, we believe in improvement through experimentation. So we actually conduct a wide variety of experiments throughout the department. Um, and we utilize these training and technology to learn and improve our management techniques. And we want to put our workers in the best possible place to succeed. They essentially, you know, we're always trying to do more with the same resources. Um, and then our, our third focus is in sustainment planning. So our frontline workforce is outstanding. We've got a lot of experience. There's a lot of skills and knowledge and tons of dedication. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're modernizing our recruitment, our training, and our development programs to be, you know, more equitable, more diverse. 
We want to, we need to hedge against the loss of skill and experience that just comes with retirement um, and attrition and injury. Um, we want to have better positive interactions with the public and we want to provide multiple avenues for advancement within the Department of Public Works and within the city. Um, so we really view, you know, some of those frontline positions um, within Public Works as a gateway to a, to a citywide career and we're really proud of that. Our philosophy on the on the operating budget, how it relates to this is, you know, because we have a target goal of zero workplace injuries, we are trying to budget with that thought in mind. So, um, you know, we are trying to plan as if we are going to reach that goal. Um, because we believe that um, in an improvement through experimentation, we believe that we can demonstrate that improvement. It's the best case to ask for more citizen investment. So we have to acknowledge that there are finite limits to improvement, right? We can only do so much with what we have. So um, again, this is about, you know, putting workers in the best possible place to succeed and acknowledging that, you know, if we want to do more, um, it's likely that more resources might be needed. Um, so on our sustainment planning piece, it's really about keeping our assets that we do maintain in really good working condition. That's a budgetary priority for us. Um, this is something that we've learned the hard way over the years. Um, you know, as a department, I think one of the things that's unique about public works is our work is consistent year round. We're always busy. However, it's not always the same work at the same time, even amongst the similar labor classes. So we actually try to scale our divisional resources, you know, based on the most intense work of a common labor type in a season. Um, so sometimes what that means is, you know, we might look at it as an approach to be, um, you know, how are we responding to snow and and looking at that also through a lens of, well, that application of more resources to snow, does this give us other opportunities throughout the year? Um, because we realize that, you know, this is a this is a kind of an integrated related piece of services. So we need to kind of acknowledge that. Um, and we work really hard to share our internal resources whenever possible. Um, I think that's one of the things that, you know, I'm really proud of as being the director of public works that, you know, when we as a department pull our resources together, we can do really amazing things. So we talk about litter can collection. So what, what do we do? Um, so we have a, we activate a crew of six workers nightly to collect litter cans. Um, we augment that crew on the weekends to do targeted collections at the busiest locations. And then we perform can maintenance during the day. Um, so what you're seeing here on the screen, this is a screenshot of our software that tracks our sensor litter cans. So what this has really helped us with is it helped us with the timing of the collections. It helps us with the routing of our employees to collect those cans, and it helps monitor the can usage in the location. This enables us to, um, you know, if a can is only 10% full, um, that, that can doesn't need to be serviced that given day, that it can wait. Um, and we've done a lot of wide ranging experiments on um, how we can handle those collections. Um, and what we've learned is, you know, our most frequent can usage right now occurs in business districts. Um, you know, the collections average about every other day, but truthfully, it's occurring daily through Thursday and Thursday through Sunday. So basically over the weekend in the, in the busiest times. Um, our least frequent usage is in, in locations with poor pedestrian access and or low use transit stops. Um, We've had a practice in the past where we may have put in cans for the sake of visibility, but we've actually found that to not be a best practice because those cans don't get used frequently enough um, to warrant service. And that actually creates a problem on the back end where we have a um, you know, potential for rodent attraction and infestation. Um, so we, you know, if, if the can is not being used frequently enough, we could have a situation where the can um, actually creates a health hazard, which concerns us. Um, we also discovered that kind of our past policy on can location, it was largely ineffectual um, in spread, preventing the spread of litter through disenfranchised communities. Um, so what we're looking to do in the future, um, and as we activate our learning is we're looking, we're going to redo our policy on can placement. So we're right now, we are in a process of doing a pilot of we're going to replace sensor cans um, that are currently in high usage areas with uncensored cans, and we're going to schedule that for a consistent pickup. And then we're going to relocate those sensor cans to places where we cross-reference data on bus stop usage um, along known litter corridors um, to see if we can help reduce the litter in the city area. We also want to take these cans and we want to target their locations to areas where we know children are. I think one of the things we've also discovered is that in terms of the litter can as a service, that children are actually 
Um, once you get out away from a playground, they're actually kind of unserviced by these cans in a lot of cases. Um, and so we want to bring that service to, to, to our youth um, to help them teach and learn, um, you know, good habits and good behavior um, and give them the opportunity to kind of participate as a citizen. When we talk about potholes, you know, generally across the city, we're going to activate six to 10 crews daily to address potholes. This is about 14 to 20 people. All of our pothole requests are driven strictly by 311. Um, our goal is to have the average time a pothole is fixed um, five days or less from the time we received the 311 report. Um, so what we've experimented with in the past is um, pothole blitzes. Um, you may have noticed that in the media where um, you know, we ask citizens to report, we generate a large variety of potholes um, and we send um, about double the crews out um, to deal with uh, potholes over a several day period. Um, we've learned, we've leveraged technology. So we're right now we're working with our Department of Innovation and Performance um, on updating our pothole dashboard uh, version 2.0. And you know we've we've learned to have better coordination with our street paving friends in the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure. Um, what we've learned is, you know, fixing potholes in aggregated locations gets them all completed faster. The technologies kind of help teach us that. Our pothole dashboard lets our supervisors know where all the potholes are in their given area of responsibility. Um, and once they've learned that the when the potholes aggregate to a certain point. Um, it's much more efficient. Um, we're not wasting asphalt, um, and we're able to coagulate those that response to a given area, and it allows us to be very resource efficient. Um, we've also learned that having a consistent crew addressing potholes on a daily basis gets them actually all completed faster than doing a pothole blitz. And the other thing that we've learned is, you know, our better knowledge up front. Um, on the location and the condition, it also improves our response. So that's one of going to be one of our next steps is, you know, how do we get better intelligence on the front end about the condition and the location of potholes, um, not waiting for citizens um, to report them to us um, so that we can even have an even greater response. <clears throat> um, now we'll talk about non-snow emergencies. So what I mean by this is these are things that are situationally driven. These are, um, these can be related to flooding. These can be related to, um, you know, thunderstorms or high wind where we may have a, um, a lot of downed trees. And they can also be a facility related emergency such as a power outage at a city facility, um, water infiltration, leaking roof, sewer backup, things of those natures. So what we've experimented with in this time is, you know, we've, we've really worked hard to improve our technology um, so we can have better communication and awareness, both with our departmental clients that we're servicing, as well as, um, you know, internally within the department itself. Um, we, we've really worked hard at doing some better coordination between the divisions and the utilities when it comes to, you know, in responding to emergency. This is primarily where we would have down power lines, um, due to trees, um, we really need close coordination because it helps keep you know, all of our workforce safe. Um, so we're really proud of the, the improvements we've made in that regard. Um, we've really learned that, you know, um, that leveraging community resources um, to help maximize our benefit in this arena is also actually really critical. Um, and we've also learned to cross train our staff on a variety of maintenance tasks. Um, to help with emergency response. So that way we're not necessarily caught shorthanded or leaning on a um, very small group of people um, to perform a large volume of work. A couple of things people may not be aware of that over the 40% of the city is actually tree canopy. So our, our urban forest asset is, is tremendous. It's one of the great things I love about the city. I think a lot of folks agree with me on that. Um, I think the work that we're doing there to help manage our urban canopy, as well as, you know, expand that urban canopy and protect it is unbelievable. Um, I think most people don't realize that the city owns about um, 2.3 million square feet of building. Um, these are spread out um, among 
what I call five basic classifications of building types. So, um, you know, surprisingly, the largest building, the largest building type is in parks and recreation, um, followed closely by um, public safety. Um, but what I think is really interesting is, and probably terrifies Chief Jones, is that if I took all of the city owned facilities and stacked them and combined them into one another, it would be the equivalent of the US Steel Tower. Um, so I, I always thought that that was kind of an interesting landmark and an interesting frame of reference for you know, what the city owns and what the magnitude of what it's responsible for. Um, when it comes to non snow emergency response, what we've learned is you know, regular recurring maintenance of infrastructure is the best defense against emergency situations. Um, the accurate intelligence and information um, is really critical to on-site response. Um, community partnerships are really critical for us in terms of long-range planning and information gathering. I think there's a lot of really um, great community stewards in this city um, that are very, have a very vested interest in um, you know, creating a great civic infrastructure. And that input is actually critical for us to help conduct our long range planning. Um, and we've learned that, you know, really there can be a lot of improvements if we can have accurate data capture um, for condition and, and tough decision making. So what we're activating next in this is then is we're really focusing on improving our data capture for all our asset types and utilizing our best best industry practices for long-term sustainable capital improvements. And the last is snow response. As it turns out, we don't have snow here. So we were still gonna talk about that. That's a joke, Patrick. You're supposed to laugh. I'm laughing, but I'm muted. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of things that go into snow response. So we have a lot of planning factors that we have to consider. We have materials. Um, the big one is salt. We use a magnesium coated salt works the be better at lower temperatures. We made that recent switch, I believe in 2018. Um, we found that to be very successful. We do not use liquids, brines, or other forms of spray. We found this to be too costly to maintain and it incurs additional damage to our vehicles. Um, we have the capability to store roughly 20,000 tons of salt at any given time. In 2021, we purchased over 27,000 tons of salt to treat our city streets. Um, vehicles, as of today, we maintain a fleet of 113 snow capable vehicles. They are essentially four different classes. We have a 10 ton, we have a few 10 ton trucks, we have some five ton trucks, we have a lot of the one ton trucks and pickups. We, the ton, tonnage classification is, is essentially how much salt and material um, that truck will hold. A uh, big concern for us is the average age of our fleet. The average age of our fleet is 11.3 years currently. Um, we are planning around having a maximum life cycle of 10 years per truck. This is under review within, within the department and with our partners in OMB, but a properly aged fleet will have an average age of five to six years if we have a, a 10 maximum of a 10 year life cycle. So we're really behind the power curve when it comes to the quality and the shape of our, our fleet equipment. Um, all the snow equipment is mounted to the vehicle. We also have a small fleet of tractors, blowers, brushes, and other, other snow removal equipment that's kind of done on a, on a hand basis. On the personnel side, we have 130 personnel strictly assigned to plow and salt city streets in the winter month. This is known as the streets division. Um, these, this consists of 60 CDL drivers, the ones that are capable of driving the larger vehicles um, as required by law, and 70 laborers that also drive the smaller vehicles um, we have the capability to augment that with another 20 to 30 persons uh, based on a variety of factors. They come from you know, other divisions within the Department of Public Works. And we regularly have another 50 or 60 persons um, that will handle our city steps, sidewalks and bridges. And, and all of that work is hand removal. Um, and so that's why you see a significant resource there. We also have our heavy equipment division. This, this is roughly about 20 persons. These are the people that maintain the salt equipment on the vehicle. And they're also the ones that load um, the salt from our salt depots. So our area of responsibility is 1,200 miles of road. Um, we do have some agility agreements with PennDOT and the county. We're very appreciative to have those agreements where we believe in being good stewards and good neighbors. 
um, and we're willing, more than willing to help our partners out at the state and at the county level um, to share resources um, and to share responsibility. Um, our city steps, sidewalks, and bridges, this is about 15 miles of hand and small equipment work um, that we have to do every time it snows. <clears throat> So our snow response, what do we do? You know, our current practice right now is we, we staff, 60% um, of our staff during the daylight um, and 40% of the staff is staffed overnight. What this kind of comes out to is an equivalent of about 60 plus trucks a day, uh, 40 plus trucks at night. Um, now that staffing can be kind of dramatically affected by weekend and holiday snows. Um, we have a variety of ways to mitigate that, but it, it does um, sometimes create a problem when the snow falls on a weekend or a holiday. Um, we run our support staff concurrently with our drivers uh, because that's a symbiotic relationship. If we can't keep the trucks on the road um, and the equipment working properly, um, you know, we're not going to have a snow response. So we acknowledge that those folks are working in tandem with, with, our, with our drivers when they're out on the streets. Um, and again, we always strive to, you know, we, we strive to mobilize about the 70 persons to treat the 15 miles of steps, sidewalks, and bridges. So what we've experimented with is technology. Um, I think a lot of folks have seen that with the snowplow tracker, but we've also been experimenting in the background with different staff, staffing models, um, better in-event in communication with our drivers, and better management practices um, so that we're giving consistent instruct, instruction across the divisions um, so that citizens are receiving the same service regardless of where they live. Um, what you see in the background here, this is actually a screen capture of our um, AVL. Our AVL is our automated vehicle locator. It's the GPS unit that tracks the truck's location. In this instance, um, you know, we have it programmed for snow. And we use these now as a variety of, um, this is the background that you would see in your snowplow tracker with some more detail on events are happening. And we use this routinely throughout the winter year um, as a training, as a training tool um, for our management, as well as um, you know, we've really learned to use this as an observational tool to help um, you know keep drivers on routes um, to help us understand where service is occurring where it hasn't occurred. So what you're seeing here is a screen capture of the ever annual Martin Luther King Day snowstorm. This was about 12 hours into the storm. This is, you can see here where we have colored lines is where we were and where we, obviously where the road network is not colored in, that's where we hadn't yet gotten to within 12 hours. So what, we, what have we learned um, in our time doing this? Um, you know, with our current staffing and our max resources out at the onset of a snow, the very fastest we can cycle through the entire system of streets, all 1,200 streets, is going to be roughly 24 hours. Um, now, what we found in talking with other municipalities and entities is that they will deploy about one truck for every four road miles. Um, and at our absolute best, we can deploy about one truck for every 16 road miles. The other thing that we found is, and I think everybody would acknowledge, that a lot of our roads are more difficult to drive and treat. Um, than other municipalities in the area. Um, and that's part of the, you know, the character and the heritage of the city. That's something that we think is great and this is a challenge that we will really accept. Um, the other thing we've discovered is that increasing staffing, um, it's not actually a linear improvement to road clearing time. Uh, there's a lot of experience and nuance that our drivers have to go through. Um, it takes, you know, at least a good, one winter season, um, you know, to really adequately train a new driver. Uh, we like to, we liken it to a, a pilot where they need to have, uh, you know, so many hours um, sitting in the co-pilot's chair um, and then so many, so many hours driving under observation. Um, we've also learned that it's very important that drivers stay on their routes, regardless of what the snow is doing. Um, you know, maintaining route efficiency is the is the way that we can best deliver this service to our citizens. Our communication infrastructure, the radios, the technology, it is extremely important to a sound operation. I cannot stress that enough. Um, without the radios, um, without the technology, it makes it extremely difficult for leadership to know what is going on and to understand where we have been and where we haven't been. All the following events 
really hurt us when, when we're in the middle of a snow response. Whenever we have a maintenance issue, we have truck downtime, that truck is out of service, um, that has a significant impact. Um, anytime we have a call out to support public safety and emergency response, which we will always, we will always respond to a call from public safety, um, you know, this does take away from our ability to service all the streets. Um, and the, the third thing is parking, even partially in the drive lane. Um, and some of our narrow city streets, it really can compromise our ability to service them, particularly if you live on a narrow street that's on a steep hill. Um, and they are a few, there are a few of those out there. Um, that really makes it difficult for our drivers to, to give you service. So where we are activating next, um, we're going to continue with the technology. Um, we're going to continue to refine it and improve it. Um, we're going to continue with exploring different staffing models to see if we can get a more consistent resource allocation um, storm-wide. And then we're, we're really going to be focusing on more consistent maintenance practices across all levels of management during the snow. And that is my presentation. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, Patrick, I can take any questions that you might have. Thanks, Chris. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, so one thing, general theme that I saw is a lot of your response, similar to public safety and Laura's team for community health and safety, really relies on staffing, mm -hmm. right? Um, how Do you know how much of your budget, just, you know, thinking about it for each of your bureau, excuse me, bureaus, I think that staffing would be the majority of your budget, um, except for facilities. There, I know that we have a lot of money in your supplies. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And that goes to, you know, our asset management protocols. Um, you know, we need all city departments um, need their facilities in good working order to perform their jobs and to keep their employees safe. Um, so a lot of the non-personnel, almost all of the non-personnel expenditures in the facilities budget go to relating to fixing infrastructure. So whether we have our construction division um, going out and fixing a set of city steps or a city sidewalk, whether we have our facilities bureau, um, you know, performing maintenance um, in a building and uh, whether we have architecture division um, replacing roofs, um, doing masonry work. Um, those are the tasks that we do. Um, you know, we follow a protocol on buildings where, you know, we're working from the outside in. We need to secure the envelope before we can keep people safe um, and we can keep the asset from deteriorating. Um, the second is, you know, making sure that our facilities have adequate, um, you know, heating, cooling, ventilation systems um, so that folks can, you know, be in there safely. Um, and that is a lot of what the um, Bureau facilities budget is expended upon when it's not according to non-personnel. Great, thanks. Um, you talked a little bit about technology across some of your different teams and divisions. Um, as a, you know, everyone on this call now knows that's also an operating expense. Um, could you talk a little bit about your partnerships with some other departments, especially, especially with respect to technology? Oh, absolutely. I mean, our partnership with with um, with INP um, and innovation and performance, it's absolutely critical. Um, you know, things like the pothole dashboard. I mean, it's a hugely beneficial tool, um, you know, for for a supervisor to look at all of his 311 complaints on a map and, and be able to plan it out. Um, you know, the, it just makes the response that much uh, faster and better. Um, you know, those are those are custom tools that those individuals are building for us that is are really critical to making like an efficient operation. Um, and the communications technology, um, both in innovation and performance, um, you know, with their support of our AVL, um, as well as, you know, with public safety and their support and coordination with our radio technology, I, you know, to go backwards would be a huge detriment to um, our ability to perform services. Great, thanks. Uh, one more question from me. Besides 311, what other opportunities for engagement um, do residents have with Public Works? Um, you, know, um, <clears throat> you know, I think I think citizens engage with us a lot in a variety of ways. Um, I, I think particularly in environmental services, uh, you know, a lot of our a lot of our refuse workers are incredibly friendly. 
Um, I've experienced it myself. I've gotten a lot of great comments on, on that regard. Um, you know, our folks will show up to community meetings. Um, we'll be there to partner with, um, you know, public safety to assist them with um, lot cleanup, um, other um, matters of litter and concern. Um, you know, we've got a great, great volunteer program um, that helps address litter. We've got the, uh, you know, the garbage Olympics will be coming up. So I encourage everybody here uh, to participate in that. That's a great program that helps clean up our city. Um, I think it generated several hundred tons of trash last year, which is really amazing. Um, those are primary parts of concern. I mean, you can always reach out to us on the website if you've got a volunteer opportunity, if you want to do a neighborhood cleanup, if you want to do, um, you know, some kind of local government improvement and you want to um, engage with us. Um, you know, we have a protocol um, for those things. Um, it can be found on our, on the city website. Great, thanks. I uh, have to give a shout out to uh, a child in my neighborhood who dressed up as uh, an environmental services employee with one of those little bread tight cars as uh, a Pittsburgh trash packer. I thought that was great. That's fantastic. Um, any other last comments, Chris? No, that's it. Thank you for the opportunity, right. everybody. I, yeah, I would say thank you for, for jumping on. You you brought up a lot of emergency response with respect to public works that I you know would not have thought of off the top of my head. Um, so we really appreciate it. Uh, so the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure is on deck. So our last poll, the 2022 operating budget for Domi is the blank largest out of the city of Pittsburgh's 29 different cost centers. So is it, do they have the largest operating budget? Do they have the smallest? Is it somewhere in between? That's what we're looking for here. All right, I'll go ahead and jump in. Some of you must know your numbers really well. Uh, you were correct with uh, the answer was C, 12. Um, $9.3 million is what Domi's 2022 operating budget um, is in the document. Uh, and it's an interesting conversation because most of Domi's funding actually comes from the capital budget. Uh, that difference there is 82.8 million. Um, so you can see that, you know, for a department like Domi, it's not always the operating budget that, that really makes up the majority of their city work. Um, and then for, for reference, the operating budget for finance is the largest because of pension and debt service payments. And so with that, we have Deputy Director Jeff Scalkin on. Um, hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight, Jeff. Thank you, Patrick. I'm going to jump into some questions. So like I just said, Domi has a relatively small operating budget, and most of that budget is related to personnel. So how is the department organized and, you know, what do your different teams and staff members do for the city? Sure. Um, as you just heard, we have the 12th um, largest operation budget. So my presentation won't be as robust as the others. Uh, most of my projects are on the capital budget. <clears throat> Excuse me. Domi, uh, Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, we manage everything that is in the public right away. That includes your roads, bridges, and walls. But we also respond um, to emergencies as landslides and sinkholes. Uh, the department has three bureaus. We have the bureau traffic, and the bureau traffic manages the traffic signals, and they manage and maintain the traffic signals. And we also uh, work on the road safety projects. We have the Bureau of Design and Development. That's where your bridges, your paving, and your landslides fall into. And we also have the planning Bureau of Planning and Policy, and this is where all the policies and the community plans come from. Uh, Domi currently has approximately about 96 staff members who are on, all of them are on the operation budget. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, so you mentioned it. Could you walk me through what happens if there's a landslide in the city? Sure. So um, as the previous uh, speakers said before, when there's a landslide or a sinkhole or anything, an emergency in the public right away, uh, public safety or DPW, they're the, the first ones out there, they're first responders. They make sure everybody's, of course, safe. Uh, they'll close down the road, um, uh, make sure there's a detour in place uh, real quick for uh, so cars and bikes and et cetera don't access the, the emergency spot. Uh, as soon as the, the right away is secure, they contact Domi. Domi has the engineers on staff, and we also hold the contracts for um, remediation of landslides and sinkholes. 
So as soon as uh, they call us, we go out to site and we assess the situation and then we take it from there. If it has to be a project, then we have to ask for operation money, I'm sorry, capital money to, to uh, remedy and make it an actual full blown project. Great, thanks. Um, have to ask, you know, a question begs to be, to be asked. What about bridges? Uh, bridges is the same way. Um, so bridges are all on the capital budget. Uh, so if a bridge is maintenance, um, rehab, replacement, uh, in, it's all on the capital budget. Great. Uh, and then for the, you know, the information of the viewers, um, City Council is currently reviewing a proposal from the mayor um, to set up another special revenue fund that I mentioned about earlier for the, the new bridge asset management program. Um, so some of that will be more related to the operating budget and the special revenue teams. Uh, and then again, you know, actual work is still capital budget. Right. So thinking about the 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 traffic side of Domi, um, how is how might Domi be using street redesign and some of your programs to uh, improve safety in the city? And what I'm thinking about here is how can we make it so that we don't have to respond to emergencies on the streets? So right now, Domi's looking at streets as a network. Right now, is we're looking to slow down traffic. Um, one of the biggest uh, complaints and the biggest um, 311 requests we receive right now is for traffic calming. Uh, so we work, we're working on currently um, 37 traffic calming projects. And this past year, we had over 700 requests for traffic calming. Um, so we're looking at street by street to see which uh, streets warrant a traffic calming project. And uh, those will be on the capital budget for the following year. Uh, we're also looking at signal redesign. That also helps, uh, doesn't bottleneck the traffic, and it also keeps the traffic mo moving a lot freely and safer. Uh, we also have a new program we started uh, right during COVID. It's called Safe Routes to School. It's a program to get children uh, be able to walk and uh, bike or uh, take a bus and get from uh, their home to school safely. And that's have, being able to have uh, highly visible crosswalks with crossing guards and also safe sidewalks to walk on to be able to get uh, to school and from home from school. Great, thanks. So thinking about both of these topics, you know, landslides, street design, things like that. Um, besides staff time, uh, which you can comment on if you'd like, you know, how, how does the city of Pittsburgh operating budget influence and work into these projects that you've already said are very capital heavy? Sure. Um, of course, like you just said, staff. I mean, we need staff to do the work. Um, so staff is on the operation budget. So is our vehicles. I mean, we have trucks and we have um, cars to get people from, uh, you know, from this office to the site. And also we have a lot of unique projects or a lot of unique um, items in the city that um, are also for a safety, like the Washington Boulevard floodgates on Washington Boulevard. If there's um, high intense rains, the floodgates do come down and it prevents vehicles from access in the road. Um, that's been very, very uh, helpful and very, very useful, but we need operation dollars to keep that, that system running. Day-to-day um, -day for traffic division repairs, it's anything from like if a uh, signal goes out and we have to replace the signal, timers go out on signals. So we actually have to go back into the control box of the signals and replace them. That's all on the operation budget. Uh, pedestrian crosswalks, uh, we have to man maintain them. That's new paint, new um, crosswalks, uh, new um, high vis, uh, um, you know, ADA ramps, everything on that end is all on the operation budget. Cool. Um, another question back to landslides and, and sinkholes and things of that nature. How do you expect changes in weather patterns will impact your day-to-day -day operations? Climate change, I mean, it depends. I mean, we all know that. I mean, these past couple of weeks, it hasn't been raining at all. And we really haven't had, uh, knocking on wood here, we really haven't had uh, too much of an issue. But the more rain, the more rain we receive, um, you know, that's, that's what really is one of the issues for landslides and also sinkholes. Right. Um, one another related thing with Domi that I'll, I'll mention for, for the residents and people watching, uh, similar <laughs> to Laura's team, uh, mobility and infrastructure also receives a lot of grants. So there is a lot of funding in the special revenue accounts that um, the grants officers 
um, really work with, with Jeff's team to, to manage, maintain, um, move through projects, deal with compliance reporting, things like that. Um, some examples would be partnerships with PennDOT, the federal government, you know, the Department of Transportation, the URA, uh, Urban Redevelopment Authority, the Sports and Exhibition Authority, um, you know, the 579 cap um, connecting downtown into the Lower Hill District is a recently completed project. Um, so, you know, it's not just operating in capital. Sometimes there's operating grant capital components. It's really a, an intertwined um, partnership up here in, in the office management and budget with our different teams. Um, Jeff, anything else you want to comment on? Nope, oh, that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so what I would like to do now is just give you a few more reminders about public engagement. One, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching this presentation. This is engagement. Um, you are being a part of this. Um, it's important to engage with the city because we are directing your taxpayer dollars and your input is critical. Um, it's valuable and we do care. So engagements can come in many shapes and forms. Um, earlier this year, Assistant Director Dave Hutchinson and I and uh, the operating capital teams um, worked with the Office of Neighborhood Services to do budget 101 sessions with a few community groups, um, testing out, you know, some pilots, things like that. And I think it went really well. You know, we gave a high level overview uh, and similar to this conversation, we, um, you know, opened things up for question and answer. Attending or watching public meetings for both budgets. Like I said earlier, the capital forums um, are done this year. Um, they're available to watch on the city channel page and uh, there are links from the engage page as well. Um, there is one more operating forum that will take place next week and I'll get there in a little bit. Completing some surveys. Um, on the operating side, what we are looking for is your general input. Um, you know, what, what do you think about whether some revenue sources increase or decrease? Um, how would you increase, decrease, or maintain spending for various um, departments and offices within the city of Pittsburgh. On the capital side, it is much easier to pinpoint a specific location for a, um, a project. You know, we need a stop sign, we need this, we need that. There actually is a geo mapping tool where you can tag a location um, and in addition, complete the capital survey. Those have closed for uh, this year, but the operating survey is open and will remain open through the forum next week. Um, you can submit online budget simulations. Those will really come into play this year between our September and November budgets. Um, we'll, we'll be looking for responses um, and feedback on, on our preliminary budget that Mayor Ganey is going to present. Uh, you can also use um, the tool on the budget simulator to really see where your tax dollars are going. Um, it's a cool tax receipt tool and it allows you to say, see, okay, of my property taxes, um, you know, X percent is going towards um, city council salaries, the next percent is going towards this office and that office. Um, as always, you can inter interact with 311 departments, the mayor's office and city council offices. Um, everyone who spoke tonight gave a, a lot of good um, feedback and ways that you can engage with our department um, and office staff. Also, like I mentioned, there are some educational guides in the budget documents. Um, if you want to dig into to some of the text, um, there is a lot of information there as well. So this year, public input will be reported to department directors, uh, the mayor's office and city council. On the operating side, when the survey results close, the operating team will very quickly turn around and synthesize results. Um, and we will share them with department directors before their submissions are due so that they can take the opportunity to, you know, to let it sink in and kind of see what residents are, are thinking about with respect to next year's day-to-day -day, um, operating budget. We'll also share it with mayor's office, city council, um, and there will be, you know, some executive summaries reposted back online to, to close the feedback loop. So here's a list of, of good resources. The OMB website, there are operating budgets, there are capital budgets. We have a, a shorter budget and brief that is really just the top level. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, there are quarterly reports that, that keep active tabs as spending moves through. The Engage page um, has a lot of cool projects that the city is working on across many departments. We have a page for the budget experience for 2023. 
Um, there are informational videos. Um, the mayor and deputy mayor filmed a, a short conversation that really goes through what's the budget process about. Um, the links to the surveys are there as well. Uh, links to the YouTube forums and things like that. Contact information for the operating team, OMB operating at pittsburghpa.gov. For the capital team, if you do have questions, it's CIP, that's Capital Improvement Plan, at pittsburghpa.gov. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, I will go in and we'll make sure that the resources um, and websites from our, our partner departments are, are added in as well. And we can open this up for, for questions. First, reading through some of these in the chat. Um, Char, apologies for mispronunciations when I get there. Charlie Ellison asked, for DPW, could you please give an update on the Division Four building? Absolutely. Um, right now, we're currently finalizing our design. We're um, in the process of preparing um, documentation to go to uh, PLI and city planning for you know, final permit review. Um, from there, we're looking to a quick turnaround. Um, we will let a, a construction bid package um, sometime in the near future, you know, hopefully within the next 60 days, um, with the anticipation of trying to get the project begun, uh, this fall, um, you know, construction resources and, um, you know, supply chain issues, notwithstanding. Great. Thanks. And I would just add on, um, you know, that a lot of that construction is really capital, but Chris's team is, is really coming through from the operating budget on this side. Um, another one for Chris that I believe came up um, while he was giving the conversation about snow removal. Um, what about, Bruce is asking, what about bike lanes and trails? Uh, is there snow removal for these assets as well? There is, you know, we're currently work, working through a plan right now to see, you know, what type of staffing, um, equipment vehicles are needed to support that. Um, you know, a lot of our great community partners have given us a lot of valuable insight um, about prioritization. Um, you know, we still need to do um, routing in those individual segments. Um, so we're kind of still working through that. It is definitely part of our plan. We do provide that service somewhere. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're working to actively identify how we're gonna provide that service. Question targeted towards you. Are there plans for a new class for the police academy? Uh, we're working through some details on that, but that should be announced very soon, yes. Thank you. Uh, there are no other written questions in the chat. Uh, I see a, converse, a comment from, from Ross Chapman. Always good to see that name. Um, hi, former Director Chapman. Um, we'll make sure Chief Jones get your comment about uh, certain the neighborhood response teams. All right, so with that, um, oh, here's a long one. Uh, Dan asks, statistically speaking, safer communities don't come from a larger police presence. Correlations show that safer communities are those that see investments in the people, education, food security, good jobs, et cetera. Given police is currently the largest employment category with, with regards to city jobs, what are we doing to decrease the number of police officers and increase jobs that provide a strong community benefit, such as those discussed in the section led by um, the Director of Community Health and Safety. Uh, Pat, I think I can take this one. Hi, hi everyone. This is uh, Deputy Mayor Jake Pollack. Um, I think that the, the point uh, behind this question is an, is an excellent one. And I think I just want to sort of draw a distinction between um, the, so there's the number of police officers that we have, which is driven by the fact that we need to patrol large area over three shifts during of the day. We're currently conducting a study uh, to ascertain what the right number of police officers is for adequate patrol the entire city to both, you know, ensure that we have adequate service and then also keep, um, you know, keep overtime costs and other costs under control when we have, uh, you know, inefficient scheduling or too few officers. But the, the core question is, is the right one, right? That, that um, you know, the, the job of police um, is to address uh, emergency situations and criminal activity as it's happening or after it's occurred. Um, that's an important part of the services that the city offers, but the ways in which we can get ahead of those incidents before they happen 
is to invest in safe communities, uh, welcoming neighborhoods and thriving people as the mayor articulated in his budget priority. So that's exactly why you see us placing a great deal of emphasis on continuing to grow the scope um, of the Office of Community Health and Safety to address the basic needs of some of our citizens before that calls for further emergency response. It's also why if you participated in the uh, capital budget meetings, you saw a great deal of focus on those kinds of services um, and partnerships with economic development agencies, um, you know, to increase opportunities for high quality employment and uh, and meaningful um, access to workforce development and educational opportunities. So there's really a holistic answer to this question. Um, you know, police play an important role in the fabric of city services and emergency response we can provide. But um, I, I think that the the core point behind the question is is correct that um, the way that we bend the curve on those issues is by, um, by by investing in people on the front end. And that's a, a key priority of this administration in both the capital and operating budgets. Mona asked, when will a new class for the Pittsburgh police officers begin? Um, Lee, I know you, you do wanna repeat what you said um, a few minutes ago for, this, for the sake of the record, please. Sure, so we, uh... We've been working and evaluating that. Um, we'll be releasing some information on that soon. Um, it was just a matter of figuring out the right way to do the class and the most effective way uh, to do so, so. Bruce asked, how accurate are revenue estimates? That's a good question. Um, so as we work through the budget process, the Department of Finance um, and I know that acting director Jangula will be on on Monday, um, so you could ask her again if you're able to make that. Her team works through a very robust forecast. Um, a lot of it is based on known information. Um, some of it is based on what we expect to happen. Um, you know, there's a lot of different categories of revenue, the major ones being real estate, taxes, earned income taxes, payroll preparation taxes. And a lot of that information, we can have a pretty good estimate based on what is happening both in Pittsburgh and in the, um, the metropolitan area as well. A lot of the, the data really comes at the county level at the, the metropolitan, um, you know, several county surrounding Pittsburgh area uh, and, and in our own internal data as well. So a lot of it really is based on what we know from Pat from the past, um, collection rates for taxes is an important factor. Um, with respect to permits and licenses, a lot of that is going to be impacted um, by what the market is doing, whether or not it's um, you know residential or construction permitting. A lot of that is based on um, what have is happening in the markets with real estate and economic development. Some of them are a little more stable. Um, we know what intergovernmental um, relationships might look like. We know if we're going to get certain funding sources from the state every year. Um, some things are spelled out in contracts. Um, and then to sum it all up, you know, it really depends on the year, right? We had a, I thought, great revenue forecast for 2020 as we worked through that in the August of 2019 and September 2019 and, and beyond. And then three months in, it, it shattered. Um, you know, 2020 was a very tough year for the city. Uh, we did end our actuals in a deficit, and that's a situation in which the, the budget as passed was nowhere near what it was um, for reasons beyond our control. Um, in 21, however, we, we reacted as best as we could. So we knew what was happening. At that time, we knew what some of the variants were doing. Um, and our 2021 forecast was a lot um, more conservative. Uh, and then on the flip side, our revenue excuse me, our expenditure forecast was similarly conservative because we knew there needed to be different reactions um, in response to the revenue. All this to say, um, they're never gonna be 100% correct. Um, barring any major unforeseen circumstance, we try to be as accurate as possible, um, but there always has to be wiggle room and we always have to react accordingly. What happens with surplus and deficit? Another great question. Um, so if there is a surplus at the end of the year, it moves into the fund balance, which is our just general reserves. It's our rainy day revenue um, 
you know, coffers, if you will. Uh, the, the Government Finance Officers Association are kind of our, our guide on best practices, um, really recommends having multiple months available. In city code, we have a certain amount. We have to have in the budget process, um, our, our fund balance has to be 10% of budgeted expenditures. So like I was saying earlier in 2020, that didn't happen. Um, and what happened was we pulled money from the fund balance. Now, if there's a surplus, it just adds to it. Um, so what we are looking to do now is you know, recover and, and the American Rescue Plan funds are helping. Um, we can't just deposit money directly into the fund, but what we are trying to do is, is react to the pandemic and, and get back on, you know, find financial footing. Um, I would like to thank you for attending. Um, we appreciate your time and civic engagement. We'd like to thank the Department of Innovation and Performance, especially the City Channel Pittsburgh team um, who have done our streaming. We'd like to thank Neighborhood Services, Communications, all of the city staff who participated tonight. Um, future thank for our interpreters who will come back in and uh, uh, make this more accessible as we post it on YouTube. Um, so thank you everyone. We really appreciate your time uh, and have a good evening.